Amazing. Um, welcome everyone to another localized session as part of the Green Talent Forum. We are so happy to have you all here. If you are just joining, uh, welcome. Uh, if, if this is your first session of the day, we're happy to have you. It might be like the fourth session for some people from some, some early birds. Uh, but right now we are in the session about reimagining food production and distribution, the careers that will transform it. My name is Michelle. I'm the events and community manager at Localize. And today, as you might know, we have two amazing experts. Uh, I will introduce uh, both of our experts and then we will start the conversation where you guys will be also able to send your own questions to the experts. So first we have Sam Alameyu. Um, he's the co-founder of a lot of companies uh, created all through C1 Ventures. Um, he is all recognized as the World Economic Forum's Young Glo Global Leader and Technology Pioneer. Um, he has an extensive uh, career as an entrepreneur. Over, over the last 18 years, he has been investor. Uh, he has founded uh, a lot of companies and he's actually his first company was founded when he was only uh, studying at college. So you might be really inspired by that. A lot of you are in college right now. Uh, I won't tell the whole amazing background of Sam because he will tell us a little bit uh, in the conversation. Uh, but he um, he started after he started like investing also in renewable renewable energy. Um, he has been focusing on advancing energy transition globally, and he has built some of the earliest decarbonization facilities in the world. So you truly have a, um, a world expert right now with us today. I will leave it up to that, uh, just because I don't want to like spoil for anyone. Uh, and then we have Malak Akili. Um, she's the founder and managing director of Golden Wet for Grain Trading, which represents first class international grain trading companies supplying grains to Jordan uh, with focus on food, food abundance, food security, and sustainable agriculture. Um, this company works to meet the regional expanded demand for grain commodities in MENA, uh, especially Jordan, Iraq, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. Um, she's also uh, a young global leader by the World Economic Forum, and she has been named uh, one of the top 10 young persons of the world by Junior Chamber International. Um, I will also leave it up to that. Uh, both of them have an amazing background and career, but again, I will let them like share that as part of the conversation. Um, so yeah, before we go and deep dive on the questions, I will... I'd uh, like to ask you both if you could give us a brief introduction about yourself um, and why maybe one thing that you are excited about to share with our students today. If you want to start, Malek. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm from Jordan. I don't know the time zone. Uh, each, each one of you are, um, you know, in, but I'm speaking from Jordan, so good morning. Uh, I'm today excited actually uh, to share the things that usually people, they don't share. So it's about the uh, mental health resilience. It's the secrets. It's uh, the things that we go through that maybe no business, like, you know, business people, they are not feeling that comfortable talking talking about. So I think this session will maybe tackle not only technicality, but also the human side of it and how, like why we are, who we are, it's just because we went in a life journey and it's about the people, uh, the people, the knowledge, it's a lot of things like interlate, uh, interlate, uh, like inter, uh, late together, but it's, it's, it's about us also as a human, because this is a celebration of life, celebration of what we are doing. Um, so I'm excited not only to talk about the technicality, but also to take care of ourselves and how just being yourself and following, uh, you know, your goals, you can accomplish uh, anything in any industry you want to be in. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for, for keeping it human and reliable. Um, Sam, do you want to like introduce yourself? Absolutely. Um, wonderful to be here with, with everyone and, and such a joy to share the stage or the virtual stage with Malak. 
Uh, absolutely love it. And, and she's she's right. And I think one of the, the main parts of that conversation is the human part of it and how to succeed while you're enjoying it and while you're making sure that you're making it last uh, a long time and, and then being kind to yourself um, because that's when great results start to happen as well long term. Um, so, so that that's that's something that I, I would love to talk about as part of kind of the technological innovation, the people that make that innovation work and ways to make sure that we see unintended consequences as we are continuously innovating and finding a balance. So a lot of the main topic that we're talking about today, food production is and, and distribution of it and reimagining that there's absolutely no silver bullet, but how do you balance ideas and insights and innovations from around the world and make all of that work. Um, so as my background and you've done me justice, uh, I'm originally from Ethiopia, but I've been doing this revolving door of founding companies, investing in companies, founding companies, investing companies. So we'd love to talk about kind of that world of entrepreneurship and the ups and downs um, of that process. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I love how you both mention or, or focus more on the person um, and not only about like the innovations, but who are doing those innovations and how. So actually I would like to start the conversation, focus on that. So I know Sam that part of your personal mission statement is to empower the individual and sustain the village. So can you explain what does that mean for you and how does that relate to your work in C1 Ventures? Great. So, so that, that has been a mantra for me in every company kind of I ended up kind of joining either as an advisor or a founder or, or, or whatever work that I've done. Uh, because at the end of the day, I think Malak kind of described it beautifully from the very start, kind of uh, our mental health, our identity, because at the end of the day, on an individual basis, uh, whatever you work at, either the human resource part of it, the team that helps you realize that dream, as well as your customers and your partners, your stakeholder, really empowering the individual um, is absolutely key. Uh, and, and a lot of the work that we do, it doesn't matter in whatever aspect that it takes, really caring about kind of that human aspect of our work is absolutely critical. Um, because at the end of the day, whatever you, you end up creating, your biggest asset are your people. Um, so it's so all of the, I'm actually really jealous of the young kids that are coming out of university right now. Because it's absolutely, I mean, it's scary times in certain areas, but it's also incredible time, the availability of the tools that we have um, to be able to really know yourself and, and support yourself about as well as create um, wonderful companies. And sustain the village has been a key thing for me, um, especially in the regions that a lot of um, our, our attendees are calling in from, um, especially when it comes to climate change. It has been responsible for a very, very small percentage of what led us to climate change, but we're also the biggest, biggest uh, receivers of you know, the hardships that are caused from climate change, from the pl the flooding in Pakistan, El Nino failed in 2016 in East Africa and part of the Middle East for just like the rain fell us for like six weeks, seven weeks max. And it was, you know, absolute devastations. So it's really, really important to be part of that solution to really advance um, our work. And then it's combining that. Uh, this beautiful planet that we have and, and and doing it in a way that that allows us to empower our circle, our own team, um, our kind of extended uh, customers, stakeholders and partners within our communities as well as uh, on a global basis as well. Yeah, thank you so much. And we really appreciate, I myself and I, I, I'm sure everyone here appreciate you acknowledging that like the attendees right now, mostly like college students or recent graduates, but everyone like part of the youth population is like the receiving, the, the one that is like receiving the most like damage that we have done to the planet, but also the ones who are done it the less because they have been in the art like for like less time. Um, 
but like thank you for acknowledging that um many many times we don't have people next person acknowledging that so we really appreciate it and and malak i would like to to pass it on to you uh, now that we're talking about like these changes that we have seen on the planet um, I would like to know how you, through your company, through Golden Weight for Brain Trading, how are you tackling and, and making sure that we achieve or we approach food security, sustainable agriculture? Um, and if you can share like maybe some examples or, or specific initiative, initiatives that you have done uh, for food security in the MENA region, um, we, will, we will really appreciate those examples. So thank you so much. Uh, let's start with talking about what, when we talk about food production. So food production is is huge. You are talking about the like the whole food industry is very huge. You are talking about the production, the processing, and the distribution, and um, and but we want to you know because of the session and because of uh, you know the a time limit. I just want to focus on one thing, which is what like we do in Golden Wheat for grain trading. Um, so we were uh, like we represent international grain trading company basically to supply Jordan with one of one of the basic strategic commodities, which is wheat, which is mainly uh, wheat we prepare like you know we produce bread and bread it's very uh, sensitive for you know this region we uh, highly uh, consume a lot of of bread so this is mainly what I do. Uh, and it depends how you uh, define food security. So for us, defining food security because we are one of the countries, or mainly, uh, uh, let's say, bread or wheat is one of the um, uh, commodities that we actually, the, the, the region we highly import, so we are dependent on importation. So we focus on other uh, uh, um, factors, let's say, to ensure that the food security in terms of a strategic reserve, in terms of enhancing the way we uh, store uh, the wheat. So this is our definition of uh, food security and what we do. Um, uh, this is one second is also um, always bringing the topic of climate change. And as Sam said, you know, we uh, we are under the mercy of, of a climate. And it's very interesting that, for example, you know, it's the, the climate change is actually putting the food, uh, food production at risk. So we are under the mercy of rain. So it will, it's an affecting all crops and it's, it's giving us like, you know, the, 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 the factors of complexity, uncertainty, ambiguity. So that's one of the areas we are looking at and we in our also in golden week you are like in any platform i have in any conferences even when it's not the first priority because now for example our priorities have been shifting so we've, lately we're talking about COVID 19 the disruption of supply chain and then the war crisis but still in my opinion our true enemy is uh the catastrophe and the extreme weather changes that it's which is climate change. Just to give you a number, there is now the, uh, uh, the global yields could be actually decline up to 30% by 2050 if we kept, you know, because now on the, we are in the track on 2.4 degrees of warming. So if we just kept the same, it will decline. So this is one of the things that we need to work, uh, uh, work uh, collectively because this is it could be could, it couldn't be even one country initiative even all countries it should be starting from us from our company so and you know drawing the attention actually taking an action forward some companies by the way from the grain trading companies have actually committed to some of the agreement which is which is very positive but still it's it's a momentum and we need to create this momentum so other people would join but the story for in my opinion even also in golden week is actually we have to uh, the way the telling the story, the approach when you tell people, it should be different in terms of saying, if we didn't take about, you know, if we don't address climate change, you will not find food on your table. So it's about also the approach. And it's, you know, it's for everyone. Yeah, and I love how um, your company is like working with these companies to like acknowledge this and address this, not like as a whole network is because that's what it takes right um and 
sorry, sorry, you were going to say something, Malik. Yeah, it just I will tell you just one personal story. Yeah. Uh, because it's a personal story, right? So I'll tell you, I was with one of the, the largest landowners in Romania. And Romania, we import, Jordan, we import mainly from Romania, our wheat. And you know, I was walking with him in the fields of wheat. You know what he told me? He told me, Malak, I am waiting uh, next week. We are under the mercy of rain. And you know, the guy is one of the largest landowners and he just waiting rain. So just yeah. draw your attention how sensitive yet how important and vital and, and you know, it's survival for his whole crop he just waiting for rain so and it just you know it was so ironic in this moment when we're like walking the fields and he just waiting this guy uh rain so that tells you a lot yeah no and thank you thank you for sharing that story um it's it's crazy and, and i was actually talking about like rain and production of food um sam i know you mentioned in our earlier earlier talk uh, to prep for this green talent forum that about 80 percent of water is used for agriculture like like the example you're giving us more like with this like huge land out, own, um, owner and so 80 percent of water is used for agriculture approximately and the food system contributes about 60 percent of pollution so um, can you both provide examples of how technology and maybe data data driven approaches are being used to reduce this water usage and to minimize the pollution in the agricultural sector? Maybe we can start with you, Sam. Sure, Th thanks a lot, Michelle. And we'd love to kind of uh, use that to segue into kind of some of the technologies that we work with at C1. Um, so, so just to kind of to the stuff that you have shared, our food system, the way we produce and, and deliver food is one, an antiquated technology. So we have had it, the way we make our carbohydrates, the way we make our protein has been the same. I mean, we've improved production of it, um, but the actual system has been around for, for generations. I mean, since the, you know, the start of civilization, the way we make bread is by growing wheat and then we've changed kind of some of the mechanism and the other aspects, but, but it has been a very, 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 you know, antiquated process that has been around for a while, but it is a system that has truly, truly restrained and, and tested our entire planet. So to just give you a stat, and, and you've kind of sh shared it a bit, a super majority uh, of water use globally is agricultural food related. From an emission perspective, it's actually responsible for 29% of global emission, the other 29% coming from the production of materials, just for additional materials, cement, steel, textile, and chemicals account for another 29%. So the production of our food system and just for materials, the production system itself is responsible for almost 60%. And this is as per UNFCC's last number. And then, but with agriculture, it goes on, land use, Huge amount of over 75% of our land use is related to how we make and produce food. Um, and then it goes on. If, if you're looking at deforestation, huge uh, reason for deforestation is for agricultural land use. Biodiversity loss is a super majority of it, again, is related to our food system entirely. And not just that, up to that level, we're incredibly, and, and you could also talk about pollution, pollution of almost every kind, air pollution, water pollution, land pollution. It has that impact because it's a very pervasive system. Even with that level of resource intensity, it's not enough to meet the food demand for a growing population. By 2050, we're supposed to make 56% more food in order to meet global demand. A lot of that, is also in, in the type of food, especially in milk and um, uh, meat, especially from the cow, um, that has an extra level of intensity when it comes to our resource usage. The amount of water that's needed to just make one patty of hamburger is, is mind boggling, right? And, and in, all in all, this has came at really a significant cost to our global biodiversity, 
as well as kind of especially wildlife extinctions uh, that have really tracked themselves into kind of our food system. And for the future, as I said earlier, it's just there's no one silver bullet that just works for everything. We really have to complement into regenerative agricultures, uh, water usage, being under the mercy of the rain when we're also kind of straining because of our climate change issues. Uh, our rain cycle is extremely dangerous. So a lot of the companies that we work with are introducing uh, the next level of kind of in the food production system to be able to complement. So, so I'd love to give kind of specific examples. So we have two portfolio companies that are making palm oil. So it's almost bio-identical palm oil, but without using palm trees, without expanding and deforesting large quantities of tropical forest, but to be able to make it in a process that is called precision fermentation. Um, this is the same way we would have made our um, beer, you know, the alcohol that is in the beer. Uh, it is made through yeast fermentation, but instead of producing alcohol in that process, it could be modified just the microbial cells on the cellular level to be able to produce the palm oil um, fatty acid that generates palm oil and can meet global demand. Uh, we have companies that are making bioidentical dairy that are able to complement and make it in a way that is very natural, but to be able to go on the cellular level and how can we advance uh, food production through knowledge that we have learned significantly throughout history, but also especially in the pharma sector. This started in the 60s and 70s when we had Genentech used, because in the late 60s, if you needed one liter of insulin, you needed over 26,000 pig pancreas in order to generate just one liter of insulin. Um, but through precision fermentation, you're able to make it by taking cellular structures and just modifying them to be able to make a very, very specific stuff. So the end product is not genetically modified, but you could use microbes as a factory to make carbohydrates, fats, and proteins as well. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, I myself, I'm a fan and user of like many of alternative dairy products, uh, but, but I'm really curious about how, um, not only like vegetable, like base meals, but how can we create, like, as you said, like with maybe cellular reproduction, um, like other, like actually dairy based um, products that will be amazing. Um, Malak, do you do you want to share an example of maybe how um, your company or um, in the many organizations and even in the government, um, how do you see technology and data driven solutions like helping with food security, okay, for example? I missed the last part. How do I see technology? Excuse me, what? Sorry. Yeah. How do you see technology and maybe data driven solutions helping with food security? Can you hear us now? Yeah, now I can hear you. Sorry, it was jumped for a minute, uh, for a second. Uh, again, sorry. Yeah, no, that's that's fine. I was just asking if you want to share, share an example for the same question. How do you see maybe technology and data-driven um, solutions helping with like tackling food security? So, um... For example, like we uh, two years ago, we worked with a Swiss company uh, using the technology of blockchain to use it, like to increase the traceability of products, just to make sure that it's organic. Uh, this is one. And second, I will tell you everything related with uh, techn technological innovation that it can, could actually enhance uh, the whole process of food systems uh it just uh, now companies are coming like a lot of innovations it's just how we can scale it up uh to a more re regional and international level um so this is one example like we built the whole system of, of with this company um uh, and we we were trying to onboard uh, clients from the Middle East, traditional ones, who actually we were like convincing them how uh, it would be interesting to do the actual trade uh, using uh, digital contracts, using a blockchain. That's that uh, would be an example. The first thing I think of. But everything yeah, related with increasing the efficiency of, for example, packaging, 
uh, energy efficiency, anything related with the food, you know, using any technological innovation just to um, just to manage even not to increase the cost, right? Because we don't want the cost of producing uh, a food to increase because it's it will reach the end user. It will be very expensive. We want everyone, you know, to be able to have a, a, a decent food, you know, a nutritional food. So we want to make it efficient in terms of production, not, not only organic, but also we don't want it to end with a high cost, you know, right? So this is anything that is working on enhancing uh, and cutting the cost and working on efficiency plus quality. Right, that, that's great because you both like tackle like examples um, regarding like the whole supply chain, not only the production of, of, of the food, but the whole like chain to make it accessible at the end to the user. So that's, that's amazing. Thank you for those examples. Um, I know we're approaching the time for the live q and I don't want to take valuable minutes from our users to ask you guys questions, but I would like to ask maybe one more question uh, for both of you. So um, you both come from developing countries like many of us or like maybe all of us today in this call, uh, especially Ethiopia and Jordan. Uh, and as you might know, like our attendees are joining from Africa, from Italy, from Latin. So I'm curious to know how do you think your background has influenced your perspective on these challenges? And also how this perspective has shaped how you how you create solutions for these challenges with your respective companies. Uh, maybe Sam, do you want to start? Sure. Sure, no, no, that's a great question. Um, because I think at the end of the day, creating a solution, wherever you are starting it, to really address as local, to be focused as local as possible, but also if it is the right type of solution, if it is true to kind of its fundamentals, it usually will apply. And, and you know, the same usually is if it works in Africa, it will work anywhere. And... And, and, and usually kind of use those as um, one of, you know, a tough um, product requirements and the specification is kind of the way I, I like to think of it. And, and it has also prepared me because I've done products in multiple different continents. Um, if you really focus on kind of global impact and scale, you will end up designing and, and creating projects that really will have a significant amount of um, a biggest bunk for their buck, uh, uh, their buck. So, so as kind of the exciting thing for us has been, you know, whenever we're creating products, we're thinking of them. Oh, could reach two million people, three million people, and the food production really, really does. Um, and so, you're creating all kind of exciting products and services uh, that could reach large number of people. Thank you. Uh, Malak? Malak, can you hear us now? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I think from my perspective, it's uh, the background is, is important, of course. Um, but I think uh, now, because, for example, when you address global issues it's becoming global so sometimes you if you think only local you cannot survive and you cannot thrive uh, so I think it goes to how do we make people care uh, and I think the COVID taught us that maybe one person in another country will can actually where by traveling he can you know you get the virus anyway so that's it's like how we are in, inter interconnected interrelated somehow so I think this is that's a, that was a good lesson how uh, uh, we are as a human all of us um, if anything happen you know we'll get affected uh, and impacted anyways. Um, and also climate change and uh, even the floods in Pakistan, it's affected the food prices, you know, and we, 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 the 15, 20% went up in, in one day just because some floods in Pakistan. So I think the whole role of, you know, being a trader or being a business person have changed because now we look 
we started to look just not of what we do. It's like we now are looking at geopolitical issues, supply chain issues. So something we've, we've actually we've never thought about. Uh, you know, the word uh, uh, healthcare. If there is any uh, a crisis, is one of the countries is definitely affecting us. So the whole role of business person have changed. We, we it's like the whole definition have like redefined to we are like we have to look at at many as, aspects as well. And the second thing I think is. Uh, and it's also, this is very important for youth, is you're building your knowledge. And it's, it's, it's a quality, quanti like a qualitative knowledge and focus on the expertise. This is very important. So, because now we are looking for uniqueness uh, uh, and the companies who are like unique in providing digital uh, uh, innovation and any industry, not only food, the food, uh, food industry, uh, they are, you know, they are, you know, they are becoming famous of what we're doing. So focus on this uniqueness of your brand and what you are uh, uh, serving, serving uh, uh, the, the humans, uh, because it's profitable. A profit is there. But if you only look at profit, now we're looking at uh, um, uh, environmental and social and governance, not because it's, it's a trend. It's just because now we have it like we are obliged to look at it because there are any aspects now interfering our daily businesses. Yeah, and and I I really love your one of your last quotes. It's not only because it's trendy or because it's like, you know, like many times we see like, oh, sustainable or like greenwashing, like as something trendy that we are doing, not only companies, also yeah. users, honestly, like consumers. So I love that you're saying that like, like as it is, like honestly. Yeah, yeah um, to be honest. I mean, Sam, ask Sam. It's sustainability. It's not a trend. It's 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 our only choice <laughs> because right. otherwise we only think green economy, circular economy. It's it should be a, re a regenerative economy. Otherwise, then I'm, and 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 the other thing is the pain. The pain of climate change is very very raw and real in emerging markets. So if you've been from there and if you've seen it, like as I was saying, in 2016, El Nino, just take Ethiopia, for example, just Ethiopia, because the rain failed for six and a half weeks, just six and a half weeks, there were more people, close to 18 million, that were in food aid at that time than the really horrible crisis that was happening in Syria. Just because of like El Nino failing us like that. So the change and what is happening is so real that sustainability and resiliency is not a nice to have. It's an absolute must have. It's a lifesaver. It is part of your economic uh, stability and growth. So, so that coming from that background, I think, prepares you to really take it very seriously when you do not have a whole lot of uh, systems, like irrigated systems, subsidized systems that allow you to kind of not see it. It has to be this extreme case for you to start realizing, oh my God, it's on my back door. No, we have been, we have seen it coming and we, we know it's real. Yeah, yeah, and thank you for that. Thank you for that example, but I'm really sorry that that's the reality we're living. Uh, but that's why we're talking about it today. Um, and I know we're getting close to the end of the session. I don't, I can't believe it. it has, it has gone so fast, but so it's time to switch to questions from the attendees. So let's see the first question. Well, some of the questions that I'm seeing, we have both questions in the Q and A er, in, er, or in the chat. So one of them, it comes from Maureen. Um, they're asking um, Sam, but if you have something to add Malak, you're welcome as well. But they're asking Sam, how long do you think it will take this globe it will take the globe to adopt this alternative food production methods. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah. So, so thank you so much, Maureen, for for your question. Um, I think that's a great question. How long would it take it for it to adopt? No, we're adopting. It's actually happening right now and moving at an incredibly fast pace. So we'd love for you guys to look into companies like Perfect Day. Perfect Day is making we protein. So not a look-alike, you know, almond milk is wonderful, I love it, soy milk, but that's a different set of products. Uh, just, but if you wanted milk from the cow, 
Uh, the cow makes it using two cells, one in the rumen and another in the mammalian gland. That is really producing all of the protein that is in the cow milk. You don't need to raise the whole cow in order to generate that protein. You can just take only those two cells that are from the cow and, and, and make sure that you're only feeding them. What does that mean? All of a sudden, you could produce you know, quadruple the global demand for milk at a much, much smaller physical size, about 10,000 X low, low, lower land, about 10,000 X uh, lower amount of water, a significantly less uh, kind of an emission impact, almost like non-existence by far, and eventually cost will be incredibly competitive as well, especially when it starts to go at scale. Um, it is not just that the old kind of some of the special, you, you cannot replace all forms of agriculture, but there's some aspects of agriculture you could significantly reduce its demand. And it's a growing area where we need close to $250 billion worth of more milk by 2035 in order to meet global demand. And we're not making enough of it. We don't want to be forced. So you have incredible companies that are in the forefront that are making wonderful set of products that are meeting the strictest global demand. Um, and again, the ones that I'm, I'm kind of referring to are bioidentical, both in making the products, but also companies like Pivot Bio that are doing complementary for the existing agriculture field, where Pivot Bio makes special type of microbes that are planted with the seed. And what those microbes do is they take nitrogen from the air and convert it into the nitrogen that the plant can use. So almost having your own little urea factory at each parts of the plant. And these are microbes that have existed in nature that have just been modified to fit different type of seeds, allowing you to really go after the unsustainable fertilizer industry, to be very complementary um, and very effective. So you have all of these companies that are growing at a very um, exciting pace, uh, places like the US where you will find them in groceries in Singapore, many different areas and be on the lookout. And this type of products will also be distributed. You're not making it in one centralized area and, and shipping it. It doesn't make any sense to do that. They're made in a way where each major city will have similar facilities to complement what is coming from our agricultural sectors because we don't want to continuously deforest more and, and take up more land in order to grow more. Let us use what we have in a very efficient and, and sustainable and resilient way and complement it with new advances where the latest technology is what nature already had for you know millions of years we're just barely learning how to uh how to work with nature and the tools and the resources we need and, and i'll just leave it at the kind of one last stat which is if you were to look at just gene sequencing the cost of gene sequencing in 2006 was about 130 140 million dollars and it will take about two and a half three years right now the cost of gene sequencing is $125. And, and it takes you know, less than you know, for three, four minutes in order to get one gene sequence. So incredible advances in science and technology that are making it uh, very much possible to advance uh, the sector. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I have so many of so many follow-up questions and comments myself, but I I'm aware of time, so I will address one question that came to you, Malak, directly. Um, so Rita is asking on the Q&A function, uh, well, she's they're acknowledging how um, climate change, it's impacting the overall production and distribution of food, as we said before. So they're asking, how can we make our people aware and then a follow-up question to that. Do we have to aware our do we have to aware our farmers first and include them in policy making as well? Um, so thank you for the question. I love the question. So first let's start. I want to go just back to one point that I work with three companies, uh, first, uh, first class uh, grain trading company that already committed to end uh, deforestation 
and preserving bi biodiversity, water, landscape resources, and their supply chain. So it's positive. Companies are becoming uh, aware and on board uh, uh, on on the importance of. Uh, uh, you know, a healthy food system and, uh, and how much it's important. For this uh, question, um, um, again, could you repeat the other question? Yeah, yeah. the follow-up question, it was like, um, how can we make our people aware? And if yeah. we have to, yeah. like, for example, include farmers in policy making? So let's say that you are a young, passionate uh, uh, entrepreneur or, you know, a university graduate that like you are a, a fund and you have a message and you have a passionate about, for example, climate change and you want to address climate change. So it's about, again, the story you tell and the approach you tell. And even me now, when I tell people who are, you know, thinking that it's not our one of the priorities, I simply tell them um, that in five years if we not maybe less by the way but in five years if we not address climate change and have done actual you know ways to uh, tackle the the climate change crisis then maybe we'll not find f uh, bread on your table then people will listen so it's always about first how do we make people care and second it's about the story it's about also our approach uh, uh, and our, you know, um, mission in this universe, like to tackle this issue. So it's, second, it's of course, this is, it's, it's, it's your responsibility is about the story and the approach you tell them. Second, I believe that it comes, it should be both ways. It's, of course, we need to inform and make the, par the, the farmers involved, but it should come sometimes from the policy makers, the decision makers, uh, uh, and we should collaborate and, 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 and together. And plus now, technological innovation is very important because now you need uh, data analysis and, and data collection, right? Because it will also like help you in your decision as a farmer or as a policymaker. So it's, I would say it's a different stakeholders, but sometimes it should be with a win. It should be. So some countries, for example, like Romania 10 years ago, you wouldn't see them, uh, uh, you know, offering and exporting wheat, for example, to MENA region. But now they focus on IT and focus on agriculture. It's a it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a governmental level. So sometimes yes, you need with the policy makers that will actually push the agenda of uh, you know uh, uh, food abundance. I not only food security. I love food abundance because coming from a place of abundance, I think that we can create enough. Uh, there is, there are enough food for everyone. So this is uh, yeah. I think this, in my humble opinion, I don't no, know. No, if thank you. Think, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And at the end, you were also mentioning something that we didn't have enough time to cover, but you were mentioning a lot of like um, roles and other like um, industries that are playing a big part on like food production, food food security. Um, so you mentioned like data scientists. Uh, we have mentioned even like software engineers, people working in supply chain. So I just want to acknowledge that and take that so people listening to us and watching the recording are actually aware that you don't have to be studying, like, for example, agriculture or sustainable studies. Like if you're starting supply chain, um, AI right now, like data science, like you can actually make changes in this industry if you're passionate about food security. So I just wanted to take your example um, to finish up with that. And um, we're we're actually at the end of the session. It went so fast. Um, I just want to, before we close this out, thank you again for your time. Um, this was really, really helpful. And I want to invite everyone to this next session that it's actually already happening uh, with the founder of the Green Project Management. Um, she, he will give us a lot of skills on how to uh, manage any project related to sustainability and is actually moderated by Aishka Najib. She's the UNICEF advocate for UAE. She's only 20 years old and she's a climate activist that went just to New York to talk about climate change. So it's moderated by one of you guys, like this is for the youth by the youth. So I will really like to see you all there. And thank you again, Sam, thank you Malak for your time. And thank you, I wanna thank the Posterity Institute, which is a partner of us, and Majid uh, al time making this possible for us. Um, thank you, thank you so much again. Thank you so much, thank you so much, Michelle. That was wonderful. See you on the other session, bye.